is Christy. I am the director of student ministries here. It's so good to see all of you. Let's give a quick way to the tavern here, to all our people joining us on Zoom this morning. We're so glad that you're able to be here with us in that way. Um, wanted to let you know that the chat is open. Um, for those of you who are on Zoom, also if you're here, you can participate in chat if you want as well. Um, also, you should see we have our uh, every moment we have these cards that should be kind of dispersed or in the queues. And they have these cool QR codes on the back. So I just want to remind you, uh, and if you've never used this before, you just turn on the camera on your phone and you just kind of point it at the QR code and it'll pop up a little link at the top. And you click on that and it'll take you to um, the different individual links. If you're joining us on Zoom, those links will be in the chat kind of as you move along in the service this morning. Um, but so at this time, you can use the connection card if you would like to. So point your phone, go to the connection card. Um, this is a way that we can be connected and to know uh, who is joining us, ways that we can be praying for you, praying together for each other. Um, just a reminder, if you share a prayer request, it'll automatically be uh, confidential just for the staff. You have to check the little box that says you want to share with the uh, prayer chain that happens on Mondays. Let's see, I think those are it. There's also on the connection card, um, there is a spot this morning as you're hearing what we're talking about, um, there's a spot kind of to um, just mark or write down just a thought or something that uh, is resonating with you or some an action that you're going to take. So we encourage you to use that part of the connection card as well. So let us begin our service by reading our invitation to worship this morning. It will be <coughs> on the screen, both here and on Zoom. Um, and we will uh, read this together. So um, should we stand? Let's stand. Please rise if you are able, and let's read this together this morning. We will give thanks to you, Lord, with all our hearts. We will, we will tell, tell of all, all your wonderful deeds. We will be glad rejoice in you. We will sing the praises of your name, O Most High. Yeah. 
grande eres fiel eres bueno you are awesome you are good you are Jesus' blood that righteous man. I dare not trust the sweetest way, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all of the ground is sinking sand, all other ground. you pray with me please our foundation our strength our security is in you Lord Jesus Lord we acknowledge as we do often the anxieties of our world and of our day that there are still in our community and in our state who are off kilter or off balance due to the recall election last week 
Lord, there are things going on in our country where there is division and strife. Culture wars abound. Suffering seems to be everywhere as people recover from floods and hurricanes. You are the one who is our foundation, our rock, our solid rock upon which the house is built, the solid rock upon which this church is built and has been built for nearly a hundred years. And so we turn to you, our foundation and our strength. Lord, we, would we continue to find you to be that in our lives, in our families, in our schools, and through this church. May we find you secure and sturdy enough to carry us all. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Please be seated. So this morning, um, I want to invite our children to head out. We're going to do a little bit different. So um, first, I want to ask the two-year-old through the uh, kindergarten, you can head out that door that way, and you'll see the three that she has a sign for you. And if you're here, you go that way. Um, and then we will ask for the first grade through third graders. You're also going to go that way. And then the fourth through fifth graders, you're going to go that way, out that door. And you'll find your teachers there. You get their signs up. You can just leave your clipboards, maybe, if you don't have a second to, to pack those up, and we'll just have parents pack those up. But peacefully head out this morning. Fourth and, uh, fourth and fifth that way, first and third that way, first and third, there we go. Okay, um, so at this time we um, have an opportunity to give of our offering, and so um, this is just a time and our, a rem reminder of our dependence on God and how he is providing for us and the ways we want to join him in mission um, by giving of our offering. So will you pray with me this morning? God, we are grateful for the ways you are generous to us, for the ways that you show up for us and provide for us. God, in the moments when we uh, aren't looking for you or aren't noticing you, um, God, we trust that you are there, and we pray for eyes to see the ways that you are working in our lives and in the lives, um, in the life of our community here at Costco. So God, I pray just for uh, our hearts to be softened to what it is you are wanting to do through our ministry here and that we would Alongside you in that mission, God. Thank you for the ways that you love us, God. It's in your son's name I pray. Amen. So, giving options will be um, on the screen. You can uh, text that in. Some of you probably do that uh, automatically, um, but those ways will be up on the screen. So, let us take this moment. Steve, I am the lead pastor here at this church, and it is so good that we get to have an opportunity to be together, uh, partly because we have the church, and it's good to see one another, to be around one another. For those of you that are here, hi, on Zoom, um, we are here because we're beginning this centennial. We're looking at this next, uh, the next year as a year of which we look at God's faithfulness through, in, and around our church. We're going to be exploring different monthly themes, um, of which uh, next, week, uh, next month we're going to be heading into the idea of what God does through property, through material property and place. Um, but 
this month really has been a primer for us to understand, well, what's the big deal about history? I, you know, and, and why do we need to be concerned about history? And there's a lot of topics about that and conversations about that right now. And because I, for one, admittedly so, I'm not a history buff. I, I don't hold stats in my head, I don't hold facts in my head, but I love story. And that's kind of what we talked about yes, uh, last week when we talked about the narrative of God's faithfulness to the Israelites as they crossed the Jordan. So understanding what does history really mean. But to dive in deeper, because our church is so deep in wealth, in knowledge and understanding and faithfulness, I managed to recruit three amazing people within our church who love God and love history. And so uh, they are going to do the preaching for me today. But regardless, God's word comes alive, and I'm just so glad to have uh, these men and women to join us today. And I want to introduce, um, I want them to, to introduce themselves. Um, I've already kind of prepped them, but um, I'm very grateful for you all to be here. When I asked them, they were just delighted. They said, yes, we would love to talk about history. So great. <laughs> Buckle up, people. This is going to be a wild ride. We just had a conversation last week, and we talked about it, and we couldn't stop talking about history. They can stop talking about history. I love listening about it. Um, so with that, um, I'm just going to invite Janet and then Liz and then Kyle to share, introduce yourself, kind of your background with regard to history and your favorite historical era, person, uh, figure, or event. All right? So just to get them, you can kind of categorize them after that and get a better idea of who they really are. So Janet, go ahead. Oh, my. <laughs> um... Well, I am a teacher. I'm um, semi-retired, but I'm currently teaching full-time in South Pasadena High School. Um, I have taught 6th through 11th grade history at one point or another in my, what is it now, 21 years of teaching. And for the past five summers, I've been teaching world history, kind of a five-week intensive, you know, hold on to your hats, we're running through this kind of thing. Um, but I've also really enjoyed teaching U.S. history. I taught eighth grade U.S. history probably for eight years. And that's probably my favorite period of time is the sort of founding of our country up through post-Civil War and that area. A lot of really key stuff happens and it's really interesting. To me, it's really interesting. <laughs> Not everybody, <laughs> but yes. So hi, I'm Liz Leahy and I'm a new member at uh, a Pasadena Covenant. Um, I am a joint faculty member at Azusa Pacific Seminary and um, the seminary librarian, and I've been teaching church history for 20 years, uh, both to grad and undergrad students. Um, I'm with Steve, though. I love the stories. That, that's what really draws me into history. I think my favorite people are a small group of people that were in England in the latter part of the 18th century that were known as the Clapham Saints. You might be familiar with William, William Wilberforce, and he was, he's recognized as kind of the leader of the group, but the whole group um, has importance to me, not only for their work on abolition, but their work on prison reform, um, poverty issues. It's amazing what a small Bible study was able to do with their group of members. And my name is Kyle Michelson. I've been teaching at Pasadena High School um, for 16 years, and I, I teach European history is uh, kind of the main thing I teach there. And I would say my favorite person in history is a illiterate teenage peasant woman from France. Her name was Joan of Arc. And in the 1400s, France is in the midst of this hundred years war with Britain. They are losing. Things are looking grim. And Joan of Arc gets a vision from God that says, I'm going to lead your country into battle. Even though you have no military experience and you don't know how to read or write and you're not wealthy. And she ends up doing it. And it's like the turning point of the war. And she ends up getting killed later on. But it's, for me, it's this amazing story about a teenager about the power of God working through people, and uh, it's a great story, so yeah. Wow, I, I, love, I love it. I mean, I, we, can, we can just spend a, a day on each of these subjects at least and just talk about it at length, and I love that. Uh, now, 
Uh, what, to give us a little bit more of a fleshing out of like what your experience is growing up with, especially when it comes to history, when was the first time, and not all of you have to answer this, but when was the first time you f fell in love with the subject of history? So for me, it was my first year in college. I was uh, originally a music major and then was not really feeling that music major. And uh, I took a history class and uh, the professor, um, it, was, uh, it was on the Middle East and it was in the late 90s. So um, we were talking about the country of Iraq and uh, this is after the Gulf War. And my view of Iraq was essentially there was this guy named Saddam Hussein, this really bad guy, and we drove him out of Kuwait, and that was a good thing. And, and he kind of presented this other side where his daughter was working with people in Iraq, and we had major sanctions on that country, and they didn't have food and all. And it was like this different view of, of this land that I had always interpreted one way. And I, I think I, what I realized in that moment was this thing is so much more complex that I'm getting one side of the narrative. And so it made me really want to look at historically like what's happened in the Middle East and what's happened in our world from these different perspectives beyond just what I've been informed of the story. I, I have to think back. Um, I had a wonderful sixth grade teacher who included Latin American history for some reason. I, maybe it was the standards back then. And I kind of fell in love with Latin America and then started learning Spanish and still do that today. Um, I know I took one of the very first AP US history classes that was offered at my high school. And then when I was ready to go off to college, a friend of my dad's who had been a missionary, I think in the Navajo nation, um, he, he made a comment to me that kind of stuck with me. He said, well, you know, because I didn't know what I was going to study. He goes, well, for a Christian, <clears throat> there's really just two things that you need to really focus on. One is God, theology, and the other is people, right? Because that's, God goes to people. Oh, okay. So I ended up being a cultural anthropology major and a religious studies major in college. <laughs> that kind of sold me. Um, I come to history through other cultures and the people and the relationships. That's what gets me excited. Um, you know, I, I remember doing a, a series, uh, Religion and American History series, both my loves. And through that, got interested in my own family's background, which took me back to Germany and Switzerland and European history all of a sudden became important because it was, I had a connection to it finally. And so for me, I think the, the joy of history is finding the people and the connections and kind of like what Kyle said, those, that background that goes into understanding our world. So I love the world piece, I love the US piece, but it's the connections and the people that really do it for me. Right, that's wonderful. Now Liz, I know that you have been a church historian for one score and seven years or something like that. Um, so uh, if you could tell us a little bit about why you think it's so important Especially in the day of age of churches always coming up, there's always new churches and denominations splitting off or doing, all, there's so much going on in terms of even within the, the idea of the institution of church. Um, why is it so important for us to understand church history? Good question. Um, I think why I love church history so much is that we have an opportunity to see God's grace across all times and all peoples, um, seeing how the Christian faith has been lived out and shared with others, um, and ideally to learn from their mistakes that they made. So celebrate the good things that they did and uh, um, learn from the things that where maybe they stepped on people's toes or more than that, uh, um, that that we have so much to learn from each other. And I think with the new churches that start up, and I do this with a lot of the pastors that come through our seminary, you know, I'll ask them about the history of their church and they'll say, well, Pastor Joe started it five years ago. Said, well, you know, it's bigger than that. <laughs> and uh, uh, helping them to see that some of the ideas and some of the doctrine that they, that they are teaching goes back into deep roots. That's great. 
And of course, any of you, again, jump in when you feel like it. We have some questions here, but this is a dialogue that we have. You know, um, one thing I stuck with me when it came to understanding perspectives um, or history um, was this image um, that I shared with you all about like three blind men trying to describe an elephant. And one person had the tail and said, well, obviously an elephant is like a thin stringy thing, right? It's like a rope. And another you know, was touching the ear and said, well, obviously an elephant, I think you're wrong. You know, an elephant is like flat and wide and really floppy. That's what an elephant is. And then another person said, you're both wrong as he's hugging the leg of the elephant and said, this thing's a tree. You know? and, and this idea of how different perspectives are so important to describe the fuller picture of what this is. Um, and there's challenges, especially this day and age, we're talking about the narrative of church, of history, and, and who tells the story. What are the challenges that we would face going in? Why, what are the challenges that we would face with regards to the telling of the, the story, the full story? Um, I'll take that. And, you know, this is, there's a lot of battles going on right now. You've probably seen in, in the news about what should be taught and how it should be taught. And I just want to say, from a historical perspective, this isn't new. <laughs> this has happened a lot of times before. Every time there's a challenge to our country's identity in some way, this pops up as an issue again. So no wonder people are concerned. Um, but I... I want to say that, you know, history can be kind of hard to teach, mainly because it hits close to home. Um, it talks about who we are and what our identity is and what we believe about ourselves and especially with U.S. history, what we believe about our country or world history, what we believe about other countries. Um, the good and the bad all together is, is sort of part of that. So I think some of the concern that people have about teaching history is really misunderstanding the role of history. Um, I have a little sign in my classroom because I'm teaching 11th graders who are not yet historians. And I, I hope everybody has kind of a, a little bit of a historical perspective by the end of my class. But what, I, what the sign says, and I really believe this, history is an account of the past. But accounts differ depending on your perspective. For example, that's why a policeman wants what eyewitnesses from all four corners in an accident because everybody sees something a little differently and has something else to contribute to the bigger picture. And, you know, one side might miss something. Well, we rely on that evidence to construct our account of the past, our history. And the problem is that new evidence as it is uncovered challenges us to revise our understandings. And that can be kind of scary and threatening. Um, you know, and, and so the question becomes, are we threatened by alternate viewpoints and perspectives, or do we learn from them and try to understand them and engage with them? And there's a lot of fear in that. And I think that's some of what's going on today when we talk about why history, um, especially. But you know, as a Christian, I, I, have a, I come at it a little differently. Um, First of all, I have to believe God is truth. God is true, you know, and all truth is God's truth. And even if it sort of comes from the other side, that's still part of God. Um, I had a theology professor who I dearly loved and who was very challenging. Um, he used to say, truth is two times 100%. And he was, he was talking specifically about the theologians that we were studying who would have great stuff and then they'd have a flaw. And he said, you know, that theologian is not all bad or all good. It's both. You know, there's good stuff and bad stuff that we have to incorporate together. And he also reminded us that this is how we understand God. That our view of God has to be encompassing different aspects of God, different perspectives. So God is a God of love, but he's also a God of justice. He's all-powerful and all-knowing, and yet this is the God that inserts himself into human history as a baby with limits, big ones. And so, you know, to understand who God is, we have to hold all of that together in tension. Our, our view of God can't be too small. It has to be big enough to encompass all these different pieces. And that's true with humans, too. Um, you know, those, those Wilberforce friends were wonderful, and they were also flawed. 
And human nature is the same way. We're created in God's image, and yet we've got this sin thing that alienates us from God. Both are true. How do we put that together? And so um, when you come to history, it's the same thing. We need to hold different perspectives in tension together. People are flawed. History is flawed. Um, you know, and, and people prefer to see things from their perspective. It's very hard for us to... In fact, it's really one of the challenges when you teach the younger students is to get them to think, oh yeah, there's a different per way of looking at history or a different way of looking at the perspective. It, it's, a, it's a maturity thing, really, isn't it? Um, and so multiple perspectives should be really a part of all of our faith that we learn to put this stuff together. And so for me, um, that's the challenge of history. I want to make sure that I understand um, what's going on. Uh, we just finished in my US history class talking about Thomas Jefferson. Brilliant man, amazing. And he had some pretty serious flaws also. I mean, he was a slaveholder. And uh, my favorite is he built his Monticello at the top of a hill and tried to be an experimental farmer. Well, the water isn't up there. <laughs> and, you know, brilliant man. George Washington was the one that had the successful thing, but not Thomas Jefferson. And yet, here's our, you know, he's a founding father. We, so how do we hold all this together? That's, that's the challenge of history and the right. challenge of multiple perspectives. And I, I want to continue, Janet. I, I love this. <laughs> I want to continue uh, this journey a little bit because it's this idea of, and we talked about this, so mm -hmm. I'm throwing a little bit, we're kind of meander off a little bit off the path, of the idea of mythology. Right, it's there. There is this. There's, you know, God's truth is is forever. That's what we believe. Um, I've, I'm on Psalm 136, which is just like refrain of different events, and it, there is this call and response. That the response is His love endures forever. His love endures forever. His love forever, forever, forever. And there's this power behind that, and yet there's a tendency for us as human beings to want to take one person, one thing, one. Um, cultural group identity, a tribe, and say, this is the thing. This is the forever. Um, what are the, what's a challenge that we have to try, like when you say we have to weigh both, or we have to look at all perspectives, what are some ways as historians that you can come in with, with a, a malleability to say, well, okay, I never heard that, and that actually is confronting my idea of my identity that I belong to, but let me listen to that. Anybody want to jump into that? Sure, Steve. <laughs> I mean, I, I teach a class called the history of Western civilization. And, and that's Europe. And Europe was its dominant power that takes over most of the world and colonizes and conquers. And um, so you could teach that class as Europe is amazing, Europe conquers, let's be like Europe. But I think when you start digging and you get into sources that aren't maybe from the people that were in power at the time, even within in Europe, there was tremendous voices against what was happening, against the colonization and against imperialism in the new world and against slavery and, and a lot of the racist policies that were going on. So. I think when we tell stories, what weight is given to the grand narrative? And yes, Europe does conquer, but I think it's important when we tell that story, what, what, are, the, what are they conquering? Who are these people? It's not just you know one, the one side. And that requires a lot of work because it requires almost a slowing down and looking at from all angles as much as we can. We, we have these old documents and photo pictures and primary sources. So we don't have the full picture. But then we ask the question, like, imagine if, imagine if you were on the other side of this event, not if you were the, the victor coming in. And I think that does also, uh, changes some of the perspective. Let me just add one piece from the US history side. I teach world history too, and I totally agree. Um, I love teaching from the other perspective. But for US history, here's an example. Um, we celebrate 4th of July, founding of our country, independence. And dear Thomas Jefferson, you know, all men are created equal. And then later on, there's this guy, Frederick Douglass, who's 
a freed slave, escaped freed slave. And he writes a very powerful piece called What to the Slave is the Fourth of July? That says everything, right? What's the other perspective? And you know what? As Christians, everybody belongs to God. Everybody's important to God. Their narratives are equally important as ours. So how do I put that together? You know, there's, there's big, there's names for these different types of his, US history that are supposed to be so horrible or good or whatever. But really, it's how do we connect with people on the other side? And as a Christian, I think my call is to connect with them and understand their history and their perspectives. Well, I was just going to add that sometimes it's easy to um, maybe deify somebody that you, you think, oh, this, this person in history is wonderful. And you know, in the church, we have uh, Christian people that we think of as saints of the church. And we have to realize, that, yeah, the, they may have done wonderful things for the Lord and, and for the church, but they're human people and they were probably broken like we're broken people. And uh, um, to really, to weigh in the good and the bad, to, uh, you know, that um, only God is perfect. Amen. Amen. I think that's, I, what I hear from all of you is a sense of humility. We just don't have it all. Um, <laughs> I've never said this to my children. I've heard it used as a parenting tool that, you know, um, a, a child has one mouth in two years, you know, like you're supposed to <laughs> listen twice as much as you speak. But I'd also say that, yeah, my, my daughter gives a thumbs down. But, my, but I also say that, you know, God gives us ability to open and close our mouths, but the ears are always open, right? And it's a sense of like, can we always be in a posture of listening and a willingness to kind of say, okay, can I hear the other story? even though it doesn't fully agree with mine, actually maybe can be diametrically opposed to that, to that experience. And I think that, especially for us, and this is kind of the next question I'm throwing towards you, and we're kind of already in this, um, but what would you say to someone who thinks it's more important to think about our future than consider our past one year of talking about church history? Oh my gosh, you know, it's like, why are we doing this thing? But yet, what would you say to that person that says, that let's be forward focused, forward focused, forward focused. I guess I would start with the book of Hebrews and I see the celebration of the saints that have come before us in the scriptures. Um, there's a quote that I've always loved and it, it's got various attributions, but it, it seems to go back to about the 12th century and it talks about us standing on the shoulders of giants and that if we know our history better, and the more that we know about our history, yeah, um, the further we can see. So as we are looking at the future of the church and the future uh, and being forward thinking, to really be good and wise stewards of what we're doing, we also need to be aware of what, what's happened in the past. Yeah, I think just to add that we're, everything's interconnected. So whatever's happened in the past is what shaped us now. To understand what's going to happen in the future, we have to look not just at our past, but other people's pasts. And um, so I, I think it is tempting just to look ahead. But in many ways, it's impossible to look ahead if we don't know our own narrative, how we've changed, how we've come to this place that we're in. and. And um, so that's, that's the wisdom, as you mentioned, Liz, that's the, the wisdom is in looking at what's happened in the past. Uh, to, to you all, how does your love for history influence the way that you approach your walk with God? I'll start. Um, I, I don't know that I could be a Christian if I didn't have a sense of history because Jesus was inserted into history. And without understanding his context, I don't really understand what he was teaching and why it was so radical. Um, you know, the last Bible study series in Matthew uh, really brought that home because as we understand the context that Jesus was teaching in, the challenges he was facing, even the geography of where he was, which is part of history, um, then we understand 
Matthew so much better, what his the Sermon on the Mount is, and why that was so radical at that time. So I don't, I don't think I could do it otherwise. Um, the other thing I, I just was thinking of this, you know, when I um, teach sixth grade history, which is early civilizations, I'm enmeshed in um, Mesopotamia and Egypt and some of those, those civilizations. Well, that's very Old Testament biblical. And it's sort of like I, I walk through this going, gee, Moses and, you know, Abraham and all these really cool things. And, you know, it doesn't, um, it doesn't challenge my understanding of biblical history. It actually expands it and gives me a way of understanding how unique God was in calling out those people, the little teeny group of people. So, yeah, the, the context is, is really exciting for me. I think about the fires right now. They're threatening sequoias. And they talk about, when they talk about sequoias, they talk about deep time because they live thousands of years. And I think about God who's always been. And this idea of our lives are so short. You know, we... In the midst of things, we're like, God, where are you? But this assurance, when you look at scripture, when you think about God, that God is just, God has always been. And there's, I can rest in that because I know that God has always been and God will be and continue on. I think what history has done for me and in, in my faith walk is in making me more humble and realizing that, you, so with Steve, when you mentioned about humility, um, just the whole sense of people who God has used over the centuries. Um, one of the people who most influenced me when I was in seminary uh, was St. John of the Cross. And his famous writings are his dark night of the soul and when he was really struggling with his faith. And seminary isn't always easy and sometimes there are lots of struggles, faith struggles that happen. And that just so moved me that that's included in a body of work that we as believers can look at today. So not only the, the wonderful praises of what God has done, but also, God, where are you in, you know, in the hard times? Um, but so, so all of it has been very meaningful. That's wonderful. Before we end with our last um, question, just summing up, I mean, this, this went by real quick. I don't know about you all, but wow, this half an hour has already passed. Um, there's more conversation to be had. Uh, I hope that you are all feeling a little bit challenged and encouraged at the same time. That uh, I think that something that, to sum up, what, one, some of the things we heard is, one, God is eternal and God is faithful. In the midst of our line of history, the Israelites, this beautiful story that we have in the Bible is all about God working with the humanity and a group of people so that he shows himself as faithful. That in the midst of humans' faithful, uh, fickleness and unfaithfulness, God remains that steady thing. That's why we have the banners outside celebrating not our faithfulness. Goodness gracious. It's God's faithfulness in the midst of everything that we're going through. And that history when we are able to look at the landscape of history and the human attempts with our limited ex uh, wisdom and expertise and power, try to do our best, try to do our worst, and yet God remains the same. So that's one thing that we have in this story of humility. Then the other piece is we need four points in the room to see the fuller picture, figuratively speaking. So who's not in the room? As, I mean, let's be honest, one Asian man and three uh, Caucasian sisters and brothers, we're telling a certain story from a certain perspective. Who's not in the room to help us flesh out who God is? What, what would we be able to gain from our, from, from our understanding of this faithful God if we were able? We need more narratives about who God is upon one particular point in history so we can say, wow. God, how amazing that would be. And what we're going to be doing going forward as we're going to have blog posts about our history. We have people not talking just about a certain, a certain time now, but 
the cloud of witnesses that have gone before us. And we're going to hear about those stories even as we engage with what's going on now and asking God, what will you have for us in the future? That's what I'm really looking forward to. It's, it's a fuller picture of how good and loving and wise and strong and faithful God is. And so I'm leading off with that question. What, what are you looking forward to most as you spend the next year looking at God's faithfulness in, through, and to Pasadena? So that's how we're going to end our questions today, our time today. I mean, uh, I think uh, for a church to exist for 100 years, we've, we've had to adapt, and we've had to change. And um, I, I think that's, that's really important. And thinking about today, where, where are we? Uh, what is God calling us to, to have humility, to, to listen? Um, and also just the stories of people from this church that have, that have changed my life. Um, just the, the lives that have been transformed by this place, people that have come here. I think those are awesome stories to tell. Being the new one here, uh, <laughs> I am learning about the history of this church, but I love where God has placed this church and with all the people that surround us and the ways that we might be able to minister and that we can learn from each other. I have a great sense of hopefulness and uh, uh, yeah, and seeing God at work here. You know, I was, I was, um, a couple of things came to mind. One is a friend of mine who is Hispanic here in the community had done some research and discovered, and I, I have no idea if there's a connection here or not, but it was a woman who was Swedish who actually did some research on the early Hispanic community in Pasadena. And I'm thinking, wow, that's kind of interesting. You know, there's, that's part of our local history. I love local history, by the way. I didn't say that earlier. I, I love knowing what happened here and how the big picture affects us locally. So that's kind of the, the heart of, of what I'm looking forward to is finding out more of those stories. Um, finding out what it is that we have and not letting, you know, celebrating the past, but not letting us stop us. You know, sitting here looking, I'm looking out at you all and I'm looking at brand new doors that have windows in them. Wow, that's very cool. Um, and, you know, I'm looking up and there's hidden windows in here that I didn't know were here. That's part of our history. The fact that this building is you know, built like topsy in pieces is part of our history. And there are reasons for it at every step of the way. But those reasons don't have to hold us back. I mean, those are, those are to be understood and celebrated and enjoyed, but the reasons that they did it back then are different than what we're facing now. But there might be reasons, you know, they, they they had to deal with the language issue and multicultural issue, and they'd opted to go in English at one point. And, you know, we've got our own challenges and decision-making that we have to do, and I'm kind of excited to put it all together and see, see where we're going. Thank you all, you all, for being a part of this church and speaking a word of encouragement and challenge to us. Um, Thank you for being a part of this community and teaching and loving young people. Um, so I, I want for us to, I'm just going to say a quick prayer for us to end our time, and then we're going to continue to respond to this God of faithfulness through singing. So let's pray. God, thank you for Liz and Janet and Kyle. Thank you for their willingness to share their love. It's such a vulnerable thing. And yet it's, it's a way of testifying to your goodness. And so I'm grateful for them and how you've taken them through this, their own history uh, to this place right now where they're able to proclaim your faithfulness and goodness um, in the midst of our life. And Lord, we, we pray for them as teachers, as they are instructing young people, um, that they would be one whose love for you and the love for the subject infect our kids with a, a curiosity a curiosity for more, curiosity for understanding, curiosity of, un of, of knowing and, and, and loving um, one another and loving you. We pray for us as a church, God. We thank you for how you've carried us through for the past hundred years. But we know that we did not start this church. Lord, you, you were the one that, was be with, that had, had it um, 
in the deep, deep, deep times. And you wanted us to be here for a reason. And so we follow you, God, eternal God, ancient God, faithful God, both now, today, tomorrow, and for the years to come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's give a round of applause to our history buffs. have a seat. Just a couple announcements. Ooh, sorry. A couple announcements for us this morning um, as we are coming to a close. Um, parents, we want to remind you that you need to bring your label 
with you when you go pick up your child. So the stickers that you print out, bring that with you when you pick up your child. Uh, also, we are working on uh, moving the youth room from the youth building across the street into, I'm seeing some fist pumps from the kids, yeah, from the street. We're excited. Um, so we're moving it into what was the fellowship hall. And on the 25th, from 11 to 12, we'll be working on setting up that space. So some of the furniture will be moved already over, um, but there will be a need of helping put together some IKEA furniture, <laughs> some chairs, some tables, um, also just kind of like imagining kind of what the space will look, out, look like, the layout of the space. Um, so if you feel like you're handy and you want to help put together some furniture or you have a good eye for interior design, you want to help us set up the spaces, um, there'll probably be some more stuff that we need to move over from the old build, youth building into the new space. Um, so I would love like maybe five people who would be available and interested to help do that um, on the 25th from 11 to 12. So you can just come let me know, um, come talk to me after the service or send me an email. Uh, and I would love to have you join us for that. Also, some of our leaders will be there as well, so it uh, should be a fun time. Uh, and then lastly, we want to invite you to join us here next week in person if you can or via Zoom um, as it will be the Huang's la family's last Sunday with us. And Dan will be sharing the message with us during the service. We'll also have a send-off time for them after the service. And I believe an email went out with more details about um, like an off-site kind of party for them as well, so be sure to check that email for those details. That is all I have for announcements for us this morning, and Steve is going to close us with our benediction. Let's give it up to the history buffs one more time. Amen. 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 And let's give it up to God of all history. Amen. You know, I'm before, before we got together, uh, the, the whole team, the, the Sunday experience crew, the worship and the greeters and the children's ministry and all of us came together and we were standing in the lobby and we were just sharing our names and what role we played as we're in there. Just for this morning. One day, we're all going to stand in a really big room and share our name and the role we played for such a time as this. And we are going to cheer like we did with every single person. You played the guitar? Yay! You sat with a kid? Yay! You sat with somebody that could not get up again? Yay! We serve an ancient God, but he's not obsolete, and he will never be. And so today, as we take a step out May we be the type of people that say, this step that I'm going to take, figuratively and literally, will never be taken ever again in history. Lord, have mercy on us. Receive the benediction. Praise to you, God, for your love endures forever. So sisters and brothers, may you go out today, recognizing that the breath you breathe and the step you take today is a one-time gift. May you go out in humility, putting your trust in God the Father to show you the way forward. And may he give you the courage to say yes. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us sing the doxology together. Please rise. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Amen.
go ahead and have a seat. Christy's gonna give us a couple of closing announcements. If you were joining us on Zoom this morning and you have about 15 minutes, you'll be prompted to join a breakout room, just a great opportunity to reflect on anything that was said this morning to check in with one another, just to spend some time in that community. Um, and then we just want to say thank you for being here with us this morning. It was great to see you all, and we will see you next week. Have a great week.